I'd like to welcome you here to uh, this event uh, this afternoon called the, the New Suburban Homeless, How Foreclosures and the Great Recession Have Impacted American Families. Uh, we're very pleased to have Monica Potts um, here with us today uh, to feature her and her latest article in the American Prospect magazine called The Weeklies. And if you're on Twitter, uh, either, either in the room or on our uh, audience um, uh, out there in, in uh, cyberspace, you can follow us at, uh, at AssetsNAF or use hashtag the weeklies to uh, start the online conversation. Uh, I'm Reed Kramer. I direct the asset building program here at the New America Foundation. And our, our work focuses on policy ideas to help families move up and out of poverty and towards uh, economic security. Uh, one way to do this is to build up a pool of assets that can be tapped strategically uh, over time. And for many families, home ownership is a, a central aspiration. It offers a meaningful uh, connection to uh, stability, access to neighborhood amenities, and uh, a means to build net worth. Uh, but it does also bring risks, and uh, I think we've, we've seen that uh, in the experience of the Great uh, Recession. Policy needs to both recognize these risks and find ways to mitigate them. And these should probably include some protections so that people are prevented from losing their assets and having their resources stripped away. But it also, we need systems in place that when families do fall on hard times, uh, they're able to provide uh, a safety net there and then a springboard to help families uh, rebound. The, the public assistance system we have is just riddled with holes right now. It, it's failing in some fundamental ways and we need to provide some greater support and attention to helping uh, families get back on their feet economically. Um, and really, as I said, the, the, the recession's been a test and we're, we're failing uh, significantly. To, to assess uh, performance, we, we often need data, uh, information. And, and you know, I like data, like analysis, uh, but sometimes there's no substitute for, for getting out there and observing and reporting, uh, asking people questions, listening to them, telling their stories, and then making uh, connections. And, and this isn't easy, but I've really been impressed with Monica's uh, approach. Um, for the last four years, uh, she's been uh, with the American Prospect uh, magazine. Uh, she's currently their senior writer. Um, I know she started there uh, when Mark Schmidt was editor, I think, four years ago. You've been at the three, three years at the Prospect? OK. Uh, and uh, the, the, the magazine's currently undergone a pretty impressive uh, redesign. So we've got nice copies for you to, uh, to look at uh, under the, the current leadership of Kit uh, Rackless. And uh, so now it has excellent articles and it has kind of a coffee table worthy uh, appearance. So um, I recommend everybody subscribe and, and grab copies um, on the way out. So for, for her latest piece that's uh, in the monthly, uh, in, in, in the American uh, Prospect this month, um, she spent time living with families uh, outside of Denver who had just lost their, their homes. Uh, these were formerly financially stable families who have become the new homeless. And uh, these clearly were not the best of circumstances, but uh, she listened, uh, she learned, she made connections, she told their stories, and, and she came up with a really interesting, uh, provocative uh, article. So it really chronicles what um, these families have experienced, explores uh, what happened to them when they lost their home to foreclosure. Uh, so it's really a fine, uh, a fine piece. Also wanted to draw your attention to a couple other stories she's written in the last year. Uh, one dealt with uh, the significant wealth loss of minority families in Prince George's County, uh, Maryland, right outside the, uh, the Beltway here. And another was on uh, a tour about a kind of, she took us on a tour of the poorest counties uh, in the country, um, in, uh, in Kentucky, uh, Owls Owsley, Owsley, Kentucky, uh, and introduced us to some really interesting families and, and their lives there. That piece was uh, awarded a, a Sydney, uh, by the Sydney Hillman Foundation, which awards financially conscious journalism and, uh, and certainly deserved um, that recognition. So it's really a, a body of work that she's building up here that I think is really, uh, really uh, impressive. Um, also want to uh, note from the podium here, we, we had some news at New America yesterday uh, where we've just announced uh, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter will be our 
next incoming president, the third president of New America since our founding in 1999. Uh, we're all excited about this. Uh, she's the former dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of uh, Policy at, at Princeton University and director of the um, Office of, uh, let's see, Policy Planning at the State Department. Um, uh, and a lot of people got exposed to her through her um, kind of magazine article of the year in the Atlantic around uh, balancing um, work and, and family issues. So we're really thrilled that she's going to be joining us in the fall. Um, one of the founding principles of New America was as an organization to kind of elevate um, new uh, uh, ideas and ambitious ideas into the public debate. Uh, asset building was one of these ideas that there's kind of value from looking at issues of poverty and mobility and security from beyond an income lens. Uh, we've also had a commitment to kind of raising new, new voices, uh, looking at um, issues in, in, in different ways. So we've had a long list of fellows that have um, uh, been engaged in this work, writers, journalists, academics. Uh, an early fellow at New America was Catherine Boo who has done a lot of work on uh, looking at poverty issues from multiple perspectives. Um, I know um, many people admire her work. I think Monica admires her work a great deal. Uh, currently, Jason DeParle is a, a fellow with us. He's on uh, book leave from the, the New York Times, and he's writing a book on global migration. Um, so really, uh, I'm just bringing all this up to say this is a commitment we have to elevating these kinds of discussions and, and Monica's work and, and other work that happens in the American prospect as really in this spirit of, of giving um, voice uh, to important uh, stories and, and, and voices. Um, so pleased to have you here with us uh, today. Um, after she talks about her piece from the podium, uh, we're going to hear from Janice Bowdler. We're fortunate to have her here uh, as well, uh, rejoining us here. Um, she's going to give her reactions to the piece. She's currently uh, economic policy director at um, the National Council of La Raza, and she's been intimately engaged in a lot of the policy issues uh, in response to the recession around the functioning and, and the ill-functioning of our, of our housing finance system. So she's looked at some of the policy issues uh, that are really uh, in play. I'm looking forward to hearing her reactions to the story as well. And then uh, we'll open it up for discussion with, uh, with all of you. So, Monica, thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and I just want to thank Reed and New America for putting this together and Janice for joining us. Um, so I just wanted to start out talking about this is an issue I've been sort of reporting around for a long time. Reed mentioned that I had written an article about the decline of black wealth in the Great Recession, and that was something very much tied to the fact that there was a housing boom and then a bust. Um, almost all, you know, working class and middle class families, almost all of their wealth is tied in their homes. And for African American families, this was really the first generation where they were allowed to purchase homes without discrimination in every market. and so they lost almost a one generation, their, the entire generation of black wealth was erased in the, in the Great Recession. And so I had also been reporting on the housing crisis, the lack of wealth in all kinds of communities, and the lack of affordable housing. And so I knew that all of these things were going to combine to be something really terrible. And when I saw the rise in suburban poverty, suburban poverty increased by more than half around the country during the recession, I knew that there would be a great rise in poverty in communities that weren't used to dealing with high levels of poverty. And so I thought that there would be sort of few resources to spread among a lot of new families in need. I thought that that would put pressure on the poorest families who would be the most in need because there would be this whole new population of people to help. And I also thought that the suburban communities might be sort of mentally and psychically unprepared to deal with the level of poverty. And I found that mostly to be true when I went to Colorado. And I chose um, suburban Denver because that area had, had seen levels of poverty on par with what we saw nationwide, but also because I thought that um, the, the housing market had seen sort of also dramatic levels of boom and bust. And so these people, the people that I met by and large there had a hard time thinking of themselves as poor and had a hard time thinking of themselves in, as homeless, partly because this was an entirely new situation and because they knew so few families before that they would have classified as poor. They thought of them, themselves as working class, they thought of themselves as middle class, and that really sort of changed the way that they responded to their new situation. So I actually 
I reported in Jefferson County for most of the fall. I was there both because it was a swing county during the election and also to report on this, um, this poverty um, rise. And I very quickly found out that homelessness was a huge issue. I talked to people in the schools and I learned that from 2001 to 2000 and, um, 12, 13 this school year, the rise in homeless students went from 59 when they first started counting them to 2,812. So more than 2,800 kids in school this year are homeless or transitional, in transitional housing. And um, some of that is that there's been an a rise in awareness about suburban poverty and homelessness, but some of it is just there's a huge increase in need and very little resources to get those families housed again quickly. So I also spoke to a number of shelters and charities, all of which saw an increase in need, and all of which saw an increase in need among populations they had never served before. So families who were homeless for the first time, families who were homeless and had never sort of experienced any level of housing challenges before, and families who even had been sort of donors or volunteers before were coming in for food from the food bank and food from um, soup kitchens and for help, help getting new shelter. So. Um, again, that also drains the resources for the people most in need, and it also means that there's increased need at a time of decreased giving and decreased help and decreased federal money and state money for these problems. So um, this was actually also true nationwide. There was a rise in suburban homeless, homelessness nationwide and rural homelessness. So there aren't enough shelter beds. Some charities give out vouchers for hotels in the area. And some hotels have just become sort of impromptu shelters for families. And that was the situation of the hotel I went to in, um, in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, which is in the northern end of the suburbs. It's right off the interstate. There are a bunch of cheap hotels there. They all have a reputation for being nice and affordable, and all of them had families like this. So if you sat in the lobby of any number of hotels along the interstate in Jefferson County, you would see families who are living there, children who are going to school there. You would see school buses pick kids up there from the lobby. You would see families coming back from work. It's everywhere. And after I wrote this story, a lot of people have been tweeting me and telling me that they see this in their communities too, in Florida, in California, in New Jersey. And so it's really a national issue. And these hotels, by and large, aren't set up to deal with families in need. Some of them do a really good job of working with their local charities and their local agencies to connect these families to services. But for the most part, this is a place where people go and they're sort of hidden away. They're hidden in plain sight. I spent five weeks there. I spoke to six families a lot, and I spoke to more families um, infrequently. One of the most common and surprising things was that a lot of families told me that they hadn't realized they were homeless for a long period of their homelessness, or they still didn't realize that they were homeless. So one family told me that they had too much income to qualify to be homeless, even though they didn't have a home. One family told me that, she, one woman told me, who was a single mom, told me that she'd been living on her mom's couch for five years and other relatives' couches for a period of a total of five years. And she hadn't realized she was homeless until she went somewhere to get help. And they said, well, you know, you're homeless. Let's get you a Section 8 voucher. So I decided to concentrate on two families for narrative reasons, but also because the story of Bonnie and Andy and their son Drew, which is in the article, is the most dramatic. They had owned their home outright. They took out a um, home equity loan. It was subprime, they had to refinance, and they ended up owing $68,000. They started to miss payments, and they struggled to make payments. They started working with a agency that told them they could help them settle their debt and keep them in their home. That agency disappeared, and they never got help from them. They never sort of went through official channels to challenge their eviction, and they lost their home in um, February of 2012. They've been homeless since then, and they've lived in different hotels since then. At the same time, there was another family in the hotel who had been evicted from their rental home because they had stopped paying rent. And that family ended up being housed primarily because they found a, a home that had been owned by the Jefferson County Housing Authority. So it was affordable and they could get in without a down payment. But by and large, most of the families I spoke to had trouble getting into homes because the rental market was incredibly tight. Um, rents had risen really dramatically. They had been paying seven or eight hundred dollars for rent on a, an entire house, and the rents now are twelve hundred dollars for a luxury condo in that area. So the, it's just dramatically increased, and it's way beyond the ability to meet the needs of these families, what the average rents are. 
there's almost no affordable housing. The Section 8 program in the county is incredibly overtaxed. Only about 40 or 50 slots open up every year. Actually, I think 30 and 40 slots open up every year, and there are 2,500 families on the waiting list. So all of them, all of the families had been working up until their housing crisis or up until the Great Recession, and they lost their jobs and hours were cut. Many of them were still working and making working class incomes, but it wasn't enough to afford homes in the area. Many um, made too much to seek help from programs. They made a little bit too much for food stamps. One mother made $12 too, months, um, too much a month for food stamps. Um, they also needed a guide and a counselor to kind of help them understand sort of what their options were and what was realistic, and they, they didn't have that. Um, the school, the families that sought help from the schools got it, and they were very happy with the help that the schools give, gave the children to help them get to school on time and to help them um, have food on the weekends. But um, for the most part, families were worn down. They were worn down for, from seeking for help. They were worn down because they were living in a hotel, which even though it's a roof over your head, there are a number of ways in which it's not desirable. And they were worn down because they felt like the country had forgotten them. And that was by and large what I found, so. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Come have a seat. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Star. <laughs> and uh, Janice, I want to offer you the opportunity to start us off here with some reactions and, and response to Monica's piece. Sure. Well, let me start just by thanking you really for doing this article because as Reed said, putting a, a voice and a face on these families is so important and you did a beautiful job um, <laughs> painting a, a very clear picture of a tragic situation. So I want to thank you for that and Reed for, for hosting the event. Uh, uh, several years ago, I, I worked on a report with Roberto Carcia uh, from the uh, UNC Center for Community Capital. Uh, and we titled it the foreclosure generation because that's what we feel like we're really facing is a generation of families and kids in particular who are coming up in these kinds of circumstances. And we really wanted to understand what were the challenges. And, and even though, well, there are a couple things. One is I was very sad to see um, in three years that's gone by since we did that, our report, not much has, has really changed and the country really hasn't recognized what these families are, are facing. Um, the other is, is that it's these circumstances, we didn't do interviews in Denver, we were in Florida and California and Texas and, and elsewhere in Michigan, um, but the experiences were largely the same. So there's, um, and you, you can find that report. I, there are some copies of the executive summary out front, or you can find it on NCLR's website at nclr.org. Um, but a couple things that I want to um, lift up in particular. Uh, one is the, um, you mentioned the issue of schools, and I, I found this in, in our research as well, that schools were really, um, overwhelmed by the problem, but in some cases also really underwhelmed because they, they couldn't get a handle on it. They didn't know necessarily right. when kids were homeless. And so they, they knew that the problem was sort of out there, but they didn't know which kid and they didn't know what to do about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that when a family is instably housed, they are entitled to support under the McKinney-Vento Act. And schools have modest resources um, that they can put to use to help make sure that that kid doesn't have to change schools multiple times, which is or and can have consistency in education. So that's a federal. That's right. That's mandate. a federal yeah. um, federal act, that, and there's mm -hmm. resources available to schools. I think your experience, right, was that that's not nearly enough. Sort of mm -hmm. once you tap into the problem, you'll find that you go from being underwhelmed to completely overwhelmed. But that that is something that I don't know that we've sent we've really focused on enough from a policy perspective. Another um, interesting thing was the, the note that you ended on. I mean, this family got uh, what's clearly a predatory loan, and we can talk more about that. That's a story that by now a lot of us know well. But then they also got scammed again by a foreclosure rescue scam. And so that is, has also been a quiet and pervasive problem that we've done very little about. And I want to raise this up because 
uh, it's the, the issue runs right in the face of what we're doing with our housing counseling infrastructure, which is we've, we built it up a little bit in this time of the foreclosure crisis. It is now more robust and sophisticated as it's ever been. Yet, thanks to the sequester, we're going to see funding cut right. for this program. So hopefully, there was actually just an announcement by the White House yesterday that they're going to allow some uh, HAMP dollars, that's the, um, what is HAMP stamp? Um, Home Affordable Modification Program under Treasury. Uh, that there's leftover funding in that program. They're going to be able to use it to fund some um, foreclosure prevention services. But actually, the services um, for um, for homelessness prevention and other things are funded through the HUD budget and that's getting slashed. So the last thing that, um, that I want to say is really end with um, this, uh, something that you mentioned, Reed, which is a recognition that our social safety net really is not where it needs to be. And we are at serious risk of losing people twice, which is that there's giant holes in our safety net they're falling through that, but we're also seeing an economy that's prepared to leave them behind. And so we don't, we don't yet have a way to take families who have seen their credit reports devastated, sort of re-enter the economy. We're seeing a housing finance system poised to leave the next generation of home buyers behind. And so this is a much bigger problem than I think people really realize. The other place where I think it's a huge problem is in funding access to higher education. A lot of people turn to their homes to help their children go into school. That asset is gone. So this ripple effect of what it means and how we're actually going to help families um, move into the middle class is, is eroding right before us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I want to uh, open up the discussion to, to the room now because uh, it's, it's an article and a, and a presentation that, that lends itself to a lot of uh, discussion. That there's an, a number of policy points to be made that, mm -hmm. that I think Janice has begun to, to raise and I think we want to weave those into the, to the discussion as well. But let's um, uh, see a, a show of hands who might have some um, questions and I'll call on you. We'll move the mic around. Let's start right here. Yeah. There's a mic and uh, you can tell us who you are if you'd like. And Hi, um, my name is Shanti Abedin. I'm from the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, I had a question whether you encountered anecdotally any um, instances of housing discrimination when these people were seeking homes, either based on their source of income or um, you know, families with kids. Because you mentioned that the, uh, the pricing was a major issue, but I wanted to see if you had seen any other obstacles. Um, I did, actually. Uh, I forgot to mention that part of it is also that their credit is very bad now because they've all been evicted or foreclosed on. But also um, there was a family there with five children and they, they said that landlords would tell them outright they weren't going to rent their homes to people with five children. Um, those children were older too. Um, and I didn't have anybody articulate to me um, problems of finding a home for other reasons, other discriminatory reasons, but um, you know. I have no doubt that that plays a role, especially in a place like Colorado where there are a lot of tensions around new immigration. And I think that that is another level to the problem that a lot of families have. What was the ethnic makeup of the Ramada Inn when you were there and other places nearby? Mm -hmm. It was about, it reflected the ethnic makeup of Jefferson County, uh, which is mostly white, and a lot of the families there were white. And then some, a lot of families that were mixed or, um, and also Latino, and then a smaller number of families that were African American. Other suburbs around Denver have larger African American populations, and so when I went to um, hotels there, it sort of reflected that. Mm -hmm. um, the Denver metro itself, area itself, is very diverse. and. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that even our homeless are segregated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there was right here, this gentleman here. Hi, I'm uh, Ibrahim Mukman with the uh, Hospitality Outreach Program. We train uh, people in hospitality training. And we had a situation uh, recently uh, of a, a, a organization that was trying to help homeless people. They provide them with um, cell phones because we, we help them, you know, after they graduate, get jobs, and they have to, to almost all the employers now require that they go online. And, and this particular organization said that they couldn't give cell phones to people who lived in shelters because they could only have one, one cell, 
cell phone at that particular address. I thought that was a crazy policy of an organization trying to help people who are homeless and to institute something like that that is in incongruent with uh, what they were trying to do. Did you run across anything like that? Um, kind of crazy shelter policies, I guess, is what you're asking. <laughs> um, you know, the shelters there were really good and they worked really hard to help families. Some of the rules that they have are for reasons that, from the outside, I think, seem in weird but make sense internally when you think about it. One of the big problems I saw was that a lot of shelters that take families won't take teenage boys, and so you see families split up for that reason. Families with boys over 12 kind of have to do, they have to separate. Um, I saw a lot of that. I didn't see a lot of things with belongings or anything like that. Um, so no, I didn't. I didn't see that. But it does kind of uh, raise the issue of how these the public assistance programs are working, how they're delivering information. A lot of the information gaps um, are, are really profound and, and providing you know real impediments. Uh, then the, the different programs have different rules that don't align with one another. In fact, you know, create some disincentives for behavior that might be beneficial. They make people spend down all their resources before they can get um, some support in some cases, like the, the TANF program. And the, the TANF program is called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Uh, it's supposed to be there when things like a recession hit. Uh, in, in America, uh, the way it's set up, uh, it's a block granted to the states. The, the case rolls didn't move. Uh, through the recession. They were static. During the, the, the greatest uh, you know, moments of economic um, you know, disruption that we've had for, for you know, decades, um, EITC, which is another program which is designed to kind of provide some support for, for working families, it, when your income goes down, your, your benefit uh, goes down. The only program that, that really worked counter-cyclically was the, uh, the food stamp uh, program, the SNAP program. Uh, the, the benefit's quite modest, small, um, and, uh, and yet, uh, it was doing a lot of heavy lifting in this uh, recent experience. And then all these programs have different rules, and people that are uh, supposed to even administer them don't understand them. Uh, so anyway, I, I feel like it, your point raises the issue of a lot of um, there's incongruity in how we um, you know, generate information and how these programs are designed to operate and then intera in, in, you know, interact with uh, one another. Um, Monica, what was your sense of how the families kind of understood and um, interacted with some of the public assistance mm -hmm. programs? Um, well, a lot of families decided not to try to seek help from TANF. It was capped at $462 a month for families, um, and that, that's the maximum benefit in Colorado, and that is almost worth nothing. You know, it's, they would have to work for that. They would have to give up some of their assets. They would have to really be pressed for time in a real job search. Some of them were sort of doing kind of work under the table for people and they would have to give that up or they felt like they would have to give that up so they very much did not want to take part in TANF. Um, with food stamps and with um, Medicaid and another Colorado program called Old Age Pension which is for people over 60, they, they had better success getting those programs but it was still a job. You know, they had to go to the agencies at the far end of the suburban ring. They had to sit down and give over all their information, sometimes multiple times to the states. Now, states are trying to make that process easier. Colorado is one of those states. But by and large, the families had sort of a, what they felt was a trying relationship with a lot of state agencies. And they also, they didn't like having to rely on them. That was another right. thing, I think, mentally, that they had to overcome. We found that as well with um, families that we interviewed. It was like the families that you talked to. It was the first time they'd ever had an encounter with the public safety net system. Right. So they really didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. And in a number of occasions, they didn't even know they were eligible for things until they were talking with the counselor who was doing the interview um, of them. And so for a lot of the families we talked to, the state children health program and health insurance program as CHIP was, was a really big deal. Right. <coughs> because that became mm -hmm. a place where people would access yeah. and get information for a whole range of things that they That's were eligible right. for. That's right, and where I think maybe they might be reluctant to mm -hmm. accept support for themselves, it's a different thing when it comes to your kids. So a lot of them felt like if, if I can just get my kids covered, 
um, then, then we'll be fine. But it raised other issues. A lot of the families that we talked to were foregoing serious medical care mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford it. And so I, I, know, I remember one story that really sticks out. Uh, the husband was telling the story of his wife who um, had a tumor on her ovary and they couldn't afford to get it taken care of. And mm -hmm. their, their insurance was keeping their fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Here's a mic coming for you. I'll also just mention before you start that uh, this is where the implementation of the, the Affordable Care Act, I think, has the potential to mm -hmm. be very consequential. I mean, this is going to be a new, uh, you know, central point where a lot of people are going to have to go and kind of, you know, verify their income to determine the subsidy for, for their health care insurance. And, and it could be a place where they're connected with other services. So when we think about reimagining what the public assistance uh, system can look like, I think the health system will be a, uh, a key uh, access point. Yes. Um, Alejandro Becerra, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Uh, the communities that were most heavily affected by foreclosures were in Arizona, Nevada, um, California, uh, Florida, and New Jersey. Unfortunately, these areas were heavily populated by Hispanics and Asians. Based on your experience in Janice, can you tell us how um, these communities, each com community, has reacted or managed to address being homeless? And secondarily, uh, HUD and HHS have taken pride in having made advances in addressing homelessness. Uh, how do you see their, their response to homelessness? Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Um, sure. So I, let me give a general overview because I really can't speak to what the individual states have done. But I earlier mentioned the McKinney-Vento Act and one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it's so important and it was highly valuable to the families that I interviewed, which we're all Latino, is because their definition of homeless is a little bit more flexible. And that's been a challenge for our community just broadly it to, in, in order to receive some of the benefits that may otherwise be available to them under quote unquote homeless program. So McKinney-Vento, um, the, the criteria is that you're unstably housed. So you're living in a hotel, you're couch surfing with relatives. Um, but for many of the HUD programs, and I think they're looking at this, but I don't think it's changed yet. Um, it has a much stricter definition of what is homeless. And so for a lot of our families who are more likely to double and triple up into homes, they're not, they're not considered then the, um, the worst case needs. So I saw that in families that we were interviewing that there were in some cases two families, in one instance in particular, two families that had lost their home. They both moved in with a sibling. They now have nine people under one roof. Under McKinney-Vento, they're fine. Their kids can get some support for consistency of education, but the, they wouldn't necessarily qualify for a voucher, for example, because they're not on the street. And I'll also note that, uh, that there have been advances in how uh, uh, HUD and others approach the, the issue of homelessness with trying to identify a continuum of care model uh, where families can be kind of moved along uh, um, and, and their different varying needs can be met. Uh, I know that uh, there's been some you know, analysis of that approach, that it's gotten some uh, good marks for, for, for some reforms. Uh, I think what's the challenge here is that the, this is kind of a new set of families with new profiles, new experiences, new demographics, um, and, and really there, there seems to be nothing for them. That there's been no um, accommodation from, from the experience that they've been through. They really seem, through you know, Monica's eyes, to be really still out on their own. Uh, and, and really uh, their prospects for kind of getting back on their feet and stabilizing seem, um, you know, really challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Hi, I'm Barbara Cherugino. One of the things that occurs to me is that there are, like you said, there's the newly poor and then there are those who are already poor, but kind of naturally speaking, if, the, if for those who are already poor, people have to prove that they have nowhere to go 
before they can get any housing help, and that means including staying at your mother's mm -hmm. or your brother's mm -hmm. or your anybody. That's already a requirement. Yeah. So it's not a new problem. It's just that these people have never had that problem. Yeah. So it's not new that you would be expected to go live with your relatives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems with a lot of this, you know, trying to help the middle class is that, frankly, you have to help the people who are already poor. Yeah. You know, your, your comment <laughs> reminds me of contrasting your, your article in Kentucky as well, and I'm wondering if you could speak to um, some of the, the, the differences you kind of observed with these families um, in Colorado and in, in Kentucky. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Um, for starters, I'll just say that I met a lot of people who had been relative hopping, and it's incredibly disruptive to them and their children's lives. It's not an ideal situation, and and they have been having pe some people have been having to do this for a long time, and um, you know it's it's really it speaks to a need that's been there for a really long time, and that's absolutely true. And I think what was different about the suburbs versus Owsley County where I was, Owsley County has a poverty rate of 40%, and the rate of people who are near poor, so within 200% of the poverty line, is about 70%. So the vast majority of people there were very low income, uh, or low income and very low income, and they had a different attitude about sort of what it meant to be, you know, with resources and without resources and how to seek help and there were the stigmas were just different and so you know nobody had nobody felt shame seeking help from Head Start for their children and nobody felt shame sort of being on food stamps to feed their children a lot of it is I think what Janice said earlier is that families feel good about helping their children but they feel bad about helping themselves because they feel like they failed in some way the the vast majority of families I spoke to in the suburbs really felt that they had failed, and that was um, a large part of how they had re how they responded to people who were working to help them, who you know, who people who would have worked to help them if they sought help from them, and to the people in the hotel that they encountered and and how they were treated. They they were just completely sort of beaten down by the entire recession, and I think that speaks to sort of culturally more broadly the stereotypes that exist around poverty. The what it means to be successful in America, what it means to be middle class in America. You know, families struggle against that when they feel like they've um, lost their footing in the American economy. You know, I found in the, um, the, the interviews that we did with families, as you hinted at, that, so um, we talked to people uh, within a year of foreclosure. Many of them had already moved three and four times, often between relatives. And it created a lot of um, pressure on their relationship with those family members, but also amongst spouses mm -hmm. and between parents and their children. And so we saw in some cases uh, families had separated. We certainly saw a lot of them that broke up by because they had to. They couldn't all fit in one place. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you saw that and if you can talk a little bit about just the, the family well-being and yeah. kind of what was the toll there? Yeah, um, there was actually one really um, large family in the hotel. It was a, a set of grandparents a set of parents and five of the six children, the oldest was in college. And, um, you know, they had doubled up ages ago, like 10 years mm -hmm. ago, because they found then that their resources were stressed and it helped that they were able to be together and the grandparents could watch the children while the parents went off to work and the children benefited from having that, a lot of adults around. <coughs> and they were split up. So the two oldest boys were in the hotel with the parents and the grandparents were in the hotel and their daughters were living with friends and relatives around the county. They were really sad about it. The girls mm -hmm. came to the hotel every day to visit their grandparents parents, the grandfather's not well, he has a lot of different illnesses, and he was suffering health-wise in a way that the his daughter very much thought was part of the separation. He thought, she thought it was good for him to have his family around and they couldn't all be together. And part of the reason that they're having trouble finding a home is that they want to all stay together so they need a bigger home. But at the same time, if they had to split up, that would cause another set of problems. They wouldn't be able to depend on each other financially. They wouldn't be able to depend on each other emotionally and also to support the children. So that was a really that was a really big problem. And you know, people are really sad. And and I know that sounds kind of silly, but being sad really hinders your ability to sort of get better and, and get well. And they feel guilty. And, and they right? feel guilty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people all this talk about. Um, whether or not people take personal responsibility over these situations. But the people we talked to took this extremely seriously to the point where they couldn't recognize 
the systemic problems of predatory lending that had done right. this to yeah. them. Right. They really owned it and felt extremely guilty. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they take all their responsibility really on themselves. Yeah. And in fact, yeah, let's uh, go right here in the front. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Edward Smith, Institute for Higher Education Policy. I totally uh, um, um, reson comment about how uh, concrete um, poverty uh, is and how it strains loving bonds and family bonds resonates with me. So thank you. I'm wondering if you can comment on any um, families that perhaps were newly residents of suburban uh, the, the areas in which you conducted the interviews, um, perhaps five years or less, and perhaps were in poverty prior to moving to, I guess, the outskirts of the MSA, uh, and mm -hmm. their experiences trying to, I guess, get on track, um, oh, um, and perhaps not being able to in the first place, aside from those that were had already had homes and lost them. Y yeah. Um, you know, I did speak to a few families who fit, well, a few people, individuals who fit into that mold, and. Um, and there were people also who had taken retraining programs, especially in the community colleges in Jefferson County, and they were having an enormously hard time moving into the middle class. Actually, one of the families who lived in the hotel, the mother had lost her job when she was a, a grocery store clerk, and when the automated machines came in, she lost her job. <clears throat> and she had been making a pretty solid living doing that. She went to college to retrain, and then, um, and then wasn't able to get a job that was that much better. Her salary was about the same as it had been before she was, before she went to school. And I spoke to other people, mostly younger people who were moving into the suburbs, and <clears throat> excuse me, trying to move up. And they, they found that hard too because all more people are competing to try to get into the middle class, either again or anew. So. <clears throat> we had two right here. Hi, Chris and Joyce. Um, could you talk a little bit more about um, some of the barriers to receiving s services out in the suburbs that might be different than what we would expect to see in urban areas? Um, sure. Um, partly, the agencies aren't as around. If you live in the city, you will see government agencies, and you just the government presence is just a little bit different. That's partly. They're not in the malls? Yeah, they're not in the malls. And so, you know, all of the social services in Jefferson County are in one big building at the end of the freeway. So if you don't have a car that's working, it takes you two hours to get there. You know, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a car that's working, it takes you two hours to get anywhere where it would normally take you 30 minutes. And so, um, so that was sort of a structural problem. Um, the other problems were that people weren't used to interacting with the government in that way. Jenna spoke to this a little bit, but um, you know, people are used to being homeowners and complaining to the government when their trash isn't picked up on time, and and that's the interaction that they have. They don't know about programs. They don't know that they qualify for programs, and and when they find out, it's it's incredibly taxing to apply for these programs at times. Um, again, states are trying to make this better, but the forms are confusing. They're not easy to fill out, and. A lot of families give up because they feel like it might not be worth it, and then they realize they're hungry and they try again. So it's, it's kind of a, a rotating cycle. I don't know if you guys can. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, right there. Um, hi, Lisa Holland from the Community Action Partnership. You kind of answered it with the question that was just asked, but what I was going to say is you said that the hotels were mostly ill-equipped to offer and connect these families to social services, and then you mentioned that they're hard to get to. So have you heard of anything being done to address that, um, perhaps um, bringing it in, you know, bringing some of the workers to the hotels to meet with people or some central location? Because uh, clearly this is a problem that has to be addressed. Well, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> like having outreach, maybe someone that could be a, provide case management services to say, look at your situation and assess it. And here's all the things that you might be eligible for. Um, I know some states are moving to try to do these one-stop shops or benefit banks, and other states are interested in making sure their case roles uh, don't increase even during the recession. But Monica, what did you um, observe? Um, some hotels work with the county and work with local charities to connect people to resources and counselors. Um, some hotels do that better than others. Um, the, as far as outreach from the county, you know, 
they are also overstressed. You know, they, there is a lot of need that they can't meet, and so outreach is not the first priority that they see. Um, but, you know, some people do flag these families for people. Um, you know, some of the teachers at school at different times notice that the kids might be living in a hotel and they would sort of try to put that on someone's radar. But families are afraid that the kids are going to be taken away. Some families are. They're, they're afraid that the system won't be good to them. And so I think that's another big barrier. They might, they often try to hide from people who are well-meaning too. Well, and it's, it's not a totally surprising reaction either, right? When the public dialogue has been so uh, centered on shaming the poor and, and shaming people for, for being poor, for needing help, or just even temporarily needing it. So I think of right now the conversation we're having about the federal budget. I mean, we, we've already reduced our, our deficit reduction plan has been three to one cuts on spending versus raising revenue. And just a couple of weeks ago, Congress passed and the president signed the sequester into law. Like they just quietly accepted something that was originally supposed to be so painful that it would never come to fruition. Um, and that's going to be our starting place for the 2014 budget. So if we look at what um, the, the House budget proposal that's been out there, sponsored by Paul Ryan, I mean, al almost all of the cuts have come from safety net programs. And so this, the conversation seems to be dominated right now that you know, if you need these programs, there's something wrong with you and government shouldn't be doing these things. When really, I think we need to reorient to say that if we don't make these investments, if we don't, first of all, what are we as a society if we can't care for the most vulnerable among us? But even beyond that, if we can't help these people rebound, our entire economy is going to suffer for it. When we look at who are the the homeowners and workers and students of the future, we need to be making those investments now. Um, I would also just add quickly that um, all of the families I spoke with believed that there were benefits someone was getting that were easier to get. They believed that someone somewhere was having an easier time getting help and they were the only ones suffering and, you know, they didn't understand that this was really all it is, the, the food stamps, the <laughs> Medicaid that they were getting, that's, it's the same for everyone and it's not very much. Right here. Go with him and then we'll get to Mark. Uh, Blake Warnick, <laughs> National Housing Conference and Center for Housing Policy. Um, I heard you say something about uh, how rental affordability was really one of the driving issues as much as unemployment was uh, in putting these people in these weekly hotels. And I was kind of wondering if you'd heard of any policies that states and localities, particularly these areas that are pretty unfamiliar with this problem, are testing to address the affordable housing supply issue. Um. Not Colorado. Uh, a lot of cities are trying to do mixed income housing and more affordable housing. Um, uh, I used to work in Stamford, Connecticut. That city has an ordinance that any developer has to devote 10% of their the properties they want to build to affordable. But it's affordable to the area. It's not, you know, it's not really said exactly how affordable that what that means. Um, well, it is. Formulas vary from area to area, and so that's. Those things are the best I've heard of. Um, I know that, that Sean Donovan, the director of the Housing and Urban Development um, Office, has said he wants to make a commitment to building rental housing again, but you know, I haven't seen a lot of progress. Mark? <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mark Schmidt. <coughs> Um, Monica, one thing that struck me between your Asley County story and this one is you could see the Asley, in Asley County, it's, you know, multi-generational poverty. You could see going back in 20 years and the children of the people you wrote about being parents and in more or less the same situation. This doesn't seem sustainable. Like, this is probably not going to look the same. And I know this isn't what you do because, you know, it's a, you're a wonderfully straightforward reporter. But I wonder if, if you and Janice can speculate a little bit about where this goes if we you know let's say we have a decent economic recovery and a decent economic recovery in colorado um are these people able to get back into the labor market how much ground have they really lost from i was struck when you said in 2008 they were employed and weren't able to afford ha houses at that you know boom price is there any way you could see them getting back to where they were and you know a more manageable environment or are we looking at 
a situation of multi, of, you know, longer term, maybe even multi generational poverty, and what is that going to look like? Because it's probably not going to look like hotels, or at some point right. they're not really hotels anymore. Mm -hmm. that, so pulling you out of your, <laughs> pulling you out of your natural zone. Um. I'm fine going there. I, I was very, I left the hotel very depressed. I'm very worried about the children who are there now. I think this, I think the children who are homeless right now, it's going to be very hard for them to recover the, the school learning period that they've lost. You know, they, they aren't able to concentrate on school very well now. Their families lost, um, in some cases, a couple generations of wealth buildup. You know, the, a lot of families aren't going to be able to buy homes now for a long time. So even families who might have been ready to invest in a home, and this is especially true for um, areas where the boom in, was really bad and so the, the fall was really bad, you know, they're not going to be able to buy homes that they can pass on to their children now when it might be the best for them to do that. So I think that, um, you know, this isn't sustainable, but I don't see a huge rush to sort of deal with the fact that most of the jobs we are creating right now are low-wage jobs that you know that we're in a state where families are having a hard time getting the good middle class jobs that they used to be able to get that we're not in a state where we're sort of recognizing that a lot of the people who lost their jobs in the recession were 50 and older and does it really make sense for them to spend the next five years trying to return to the labor labor force and so I'm really in the next 10 years I think hotels themselves aren't sustainable, but I think we're going to see a lot of people who are stuck in a state that would have been working class before, but it doesn't look like what we thought it was. Yeah, I would, um, I agree with that completely and would like to answer the question in two ways, sort of the, the bad news and then maybe some good news. I think uh, where I started was really that we're in high danger of, of leaving a whole group of people behind economically and that that's that's going to bite us in the end because uh, that that those are big chunks of people that are not contributing to our tax base and our economic productivity and it's not a small problem latinos lost 66 percent of their wealth we've got uh, a whole on a whole range of of indicators um, tons of research coming out saying that the the next generation uh, is, n is not going to be better off than their parents when it comes to their health, when it comes to their assets and, um, and um, economic mobility. Uh, so we're already starting to see the, the warning signs on the wall that we've got a real problem. And, uh, and we, can't, we simply cannot ignore that. Um, uh, Alejandro is here, and I'm, I often quote his work, so I'll do it now. Um, 20 or what, 50 percent of first-time homebuyers by 2020 will be Latino families. Um, yet we um, we carry more student loan debt, um, student loan debt that we get without getting the degree. Uh, high um, high rates of long-term unemployment, uh, having gone through the foreclosure crisis, or being children of parents that have gone through the foreclosure crisis. We can't ignore what is a widespread problem and expect to have a robust growing economy. We cannot forget these people. What I think is the um, maybe the um, hopeful note is that um, I'm constantly struck by the resilience that I see amongst our community. Uh, and I've, I actually wanted to share with you a little bit a quote from the report that I did of this um, one family in particular that um, continues to haunt me. I, I think about them all the time, but um, in particular, we didn't. We haven't really talked about what the housing market looks like moving forward. But that's a real danger, uh, real concern that I have. That um, homeownership simply won't be available to many families in the future. Um, and when we asked families, um, not necessarily about the house, but broadly, the American dream, whatever that means to you, is it is it going to be available to you in the future? And and some people definitely felt like it wouldn't. Immigrants in particular that we talked to were very resilient. And this is a family that had uh, lost their job um, that, and been kicked out of two places since and had a pretty tragic story living in rural North Georgia. And when we asked this, um, and they were, they were immigrants, first generation immigrants, when I asked them, this is what they, they said. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I built it all up, and then that's the that's the wrong <laughs> quote. I'm sorry. Um, let me see if I can get it. Here it is. Okay. 
Um, this is the Nunez family in, in Northwest Georgia. He said, I'm the type of person that could fall and fail, but I'll not stay like this. I know that sooner or later an opportunity will come up. I believe that this has affected me a lot, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stay where this situation has me. I have to find a way, as I told you, I'm, I'm looking for ways. Maybe I'll sell water or something. I'm that type of person. I like to work hard for my things. I have no problem with that. I don't like to depend on other people and bothering other people in order to get what I want. And I think of this family often when I think about this shaming around being poor or sort of framing it as if people aren't taking personal responsibility for their lives and, and trying and giving it everything they got. And I do think there's some resiliency there that we're going to be able to build on. Very long-winded answer to your question, but I had to get that out there. It actually, the, the, the family that you chronicle, Bonnie and her uh, husband and Similar. child, also mm -hmm. seemed to, that, that resilience comes through. I mean, I, I, I think mm -hmm. one of the, the challenges here, though, is um, what the prospects look like forward, the hard road that is ahead uh, of getting back to stability. And income's going to be part of it. But the fact that we didn't help uh, with more efforts to keep people in their homes, to stabilize them, I, I think is really um, going to be a uh, profound impact. But th that, was a, that felt like a resilient family that you were talking with there. Yeah, they really were. I think they did feel like they were going to make it back, and, and that was really good. And, and they probably will, because that's what it takes, is that kind of right. resilience. But um, yeah, on a broad scale, I don't know if we want, if that's like the only thing we're going to hope for, you yeah. know? Resilience isn't policy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yet the nine-year-old, there's, there's one quote in the, in the piece where he, he, he figures out how insane it was that the bank didn't make a deal with his parents who <laughs> wanted to stay in the house, wanted to stay current, and he knew, it seemed like as a nine-year-old, that it was going to be a lose-lose. The bank was going to get less money down the road. The community was going to erode. They were going to be out. And it's just like, my gosh, if he could figure it out. And, you know, actually, Janice and I, we had events here and other places where we were talking about this at the time. Mm -hmm the need for principal reduction, for, right. for mitigation, uh, you know, modification of loans. You know, uh, Treasury left money on the table that had been allocated. You know, it's mm -hmm. just a travesty. And, and now we've, we've had all these mortgage settlements, uh, but it's, it's well, you know, after the fact, it's not going to help these families. And, and hopefully we'll be able to deploy those resources uh, effectively down the line. Uh, okay, here and, and then in the back, and then maybe uh, those will be the last two. Uh, hello, my name's Larry Turgino. You know, I was, what I think we may be observing is, is institutional rigidity in, in government programs here. We have a new class of client, a new need that emerges, and governments are not renowned for their flexibility, yeah. adaptability, and agility generally. Is, is the kind of poignancy that comes from the stories that we hear today um, going to allow us to, to rethink the social safety net yeah. in a different way so that we create other mechanisms of action that don't rely on, on, on government in, in such a profound way to provide the social safety net? Yeah. Yeah, maybe so. And, and maybe, uh, though, that we, we, I don't think we can let, uh, you know, this is what we almost do for a living here. You know, we don't want to let the policymakers off the hook. We want a system, you know, use the lessons of this experience to inform uh, you know, a more thoughtful, responsive uh, system that's really designed not to fail, but to, to provide uh, support at these key junctures. But it's true that it, it is, um, the mechanisms of, uh, are slow. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, yeah, back in, uh, last comment in the back. Don Appleman with USDA's Rural Housing Service. And you kind of touched on this in your last couple comments, but when you were working with the families, which I'm assuming here were primarily former homeowners, did you see any common threads or kind of what was the lesson to be learned as far as the type of financing that they got? Were there time bombs that were built into their loans that went off? Uh, why did they become homeless and their neighbors didn't? Yeah, mm -hmm. good question. Uh, they did have uh, loans with adjustable rates that you know went off unexpectedly for them, um, and they also many of them were also renting from people who were foreclosed on too, and they had they found that they had sort of very few rights when foreclosure started to happen, or at least they knew a few rights. They had some rights. Um, 
that they didn't know about and didn't know how to challenge the being, eviction, being evicted because the homeowner was foreclosed on. Um, as far as loans, I mean, it absolutely struck the people with bad uh, loans before, and many of them were the result of predatory lending practices, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, all I mean, this is well documented it's, now. It's, the yeah, the yeah, extent yeah. that we allowed predatory lending practices to just overtake these communities and these families, and, and, and we have mechanisms in place now to stop it with the new CFPB and other, right. other regulations, if they're empowered and allowed to do their job. Right? Yeah, no, that's right. In <laughs> fact, I think the, um, all I know about this, the uh, Bonnie and Andy's uh -huh. loan is what I, I read in the piece, so I can't comment extensively, but it was pretty clear to me. I mean, it was $48,000 with a balloon payment, and they refied, somehow got uh, 20000 added to their loan balance. That's, that's pretty bad. This and was a loan they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. and probably didn't, maybe not even need uh, all of it at that uh, particular time. And, mm -hmm. and this is what, you know... Uh, well, and it's designed to fail. It's it designed to fail, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anything with a balloon payment like that for a working class family, there's no reasonable expectation that they would have the ability to repay that back. Yeah. And that is a new rule that is a change, thanks to Dodd-Frank, that that kind of lending shouldn't be happening in the future. Yeah. They also, uh, they got the loan in the first place because their income was falling, so they really shouldn't have qualified, I would probably say, you would imagine. So, I mean, there, there should have been other ways to help them mitigate the loss of their income. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the public assistance system, the, the housing finance system and the oversight of that marketplace needs to, to uh, uh, you know, change so that these kinds of things don't happen again and, and we don't kind of replicate the experience uh, that, we, that we've been through. You know, we need to take some lessons learned. Um, and and Monica's, I think, helped us do that. I, I uh, really, it's uh, um, thank you for, for joining us here uh, today. Janice, for coming. You for being here. And uh, appreciate your time. I um, want you to pick up copies uh, of the magazine, American Prospect, on your way out. So thank you. Thank you.